Hello everyone and welcome back to day 36 of Bitwise where we uh, code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So uh, last time we started on a um, on the bare bones internals of a uh, fourth implementation coded in assembly with the assembler we wrote previously. And um, right after the stream went down, um, I made a few changes and then checked in the code. So I want to cover those changes first uh, and then want to cover some um, some kind of variations on those implementation choices before we kind of move on to the next step in terms of, of implementing a standard uh, standard force fourth uh, scaffolding under the hood stuff. Um, so let me just jump right into that. Um, so yeah, um, so this is our uh, our assembly program. Um, from what I recall where we were last time, we didn't have a return stack uh, yet, although I think I had talked about it, but I hadn't uh, put it in the in the code. So last time we just had a stack pointer and a program counter. And um, our uh, kind of our dispatch macro previously, basically, the, I think the difference is that um, we assumed that the the, the, the so-called program counter, which is not really a program counter in the conventional sense, but it points to the next execution token um, to execute. Uh, we assumed previously that this was a direct machine code address so that you could basically directly jump to the result of this load. Um, so you would, you know, previously you would basically do this. Um, so one thing that, uh, and, and that implementation approach uh, that we had at that point was called direct threading. Um, and actually, um, I can't really demonstrate it very easily because the code has since evolved uh, a little bit. But basically, the, the difference from before um, is that, well, I, I can show you with some of the, the things we did have hard-coded last time. We have a helper macro here. Um, but basically, previously, you would just have had do add colon and then directly uh, the machine code sequence to, you know, to execute that uh, word. So in the case of add, it does this stuff and then uh, proceeds to the next uh, the next word, next execution token. Um, but the difference uh, now is that um, the address that constitutes the uh, execution token, uh, rather than being itself a machine code, you know, the start of a machine code sequence, it actually points to the machine code sequence, and then that is followed by some other word-specific data. So for these def word, these are sort of hard coded, um, hard coded assemb uh, assembly implemented words that are not implemented in fourth, but that are sort of primitive uh, built in things. Um, the way those work here, as you can see by this macro, is that they have this header word, which is a pointer, and uh, it points to the subsequent label. So you can see there's an anonymous label immediately following it. So you put your code right after where this def word occurs. So in the, here, you know this thing executes and then all of this stuff gets appended after this label and you can see that this header word points to this label so that's for these built-in words as whereas before they would just basically you know there would basically not be any of this it would just jump directly there now there's sort of it's a pointer to the code rather than the code itself so there's that level of indirection but uh, one thing that that enables quite simply is that when we have user-defined words um, when we have user-defined words um, like like this, for example, um, this is a user-defined word. You can see that the very first, like the header word that I was referring to previously for this user-defined word, uh, rather than being some custom machine code, is a standardized interpreter-like thing called do col. It stands for do colon. And then followed by a sequence of execution tokens, which are, you know, these can be user-defined words or they can be, you know, these kind of native or built-in hardwired words. Um, and so the idea is if you want to execute do twice, um, you know, where, where do I refer to do twice? I do it up here in the main, main code. So you can see this is just the sequence of words that constitute the main, the main program currently. And you can see... Um, whether we're calling built-ins like add or user-defined words like twice, they, they occur here in the same way. You just essentially have a pointer to them. Um, and um, 
and then to execute either of them, the first thing you do is you fetch that the, the header word and you jump to that address. Um, so for user-defined words, that address is always going to be the same. It's going to be do col. Uh, and then do col, as, as I will show you up right up here, do col is very simple. It's just this code here. Um, these three instructions plus this generic next thing. So what does do call do? You can see it basically acts like a function call kind of thing. Um, but what it does is it pushes, uh, well, it doesn't, yeah, it, it pushes the program counter on the return stack, which is separate from the parameter stack. So RSP points to the top of the return stack. So it pushes that on the stack uh, and increments the program counter so that we will execute the next word after, let's see, is this right? Save this, increment that. Oh, I see, this is a, a three operand instruction. Um, and then we set the program counter to not XT because XT is where we fetch do call, right? It's right after XT, which is the beginning of the, the sequence of execution tokens that constitutes that user defined word. And then we call next, which will then you know fetch from PC and, and, and so on. Um, so that's indirect threading. Um, and um, you can think of this as being kind of like, it's, it, it does like with the return stack stuff uh, that you see here, this is sort of the, you know, pushing the return address when you call a function, it's the equivalent of that. Um, and then exit is sort of the counterpart, again, from the return stack perspective where it, it does a pop from the return stack into the PC and then does next. So the idea is that every, uh, every user defined word will end with, uh, with exit, and uh, that will return to where you were in the previous word. Um, so that's the idea. And then here we have um, kind of two standard words um, put forth, which uh, basically move stuff from the normal parameter stack to the return stack and, uh, and return stack and vice versa. So you can see this um, this pops from the parameter stack and pushes onto the return stack, and this pops from the return stack and pushes onto the parameter stack. Uh, and then here we have some basic uh, word load store stuff, um, which you know loads the address and the lo loads the address from the top of the stack, loads that, pushes the result. In the case of store, of course, you need both the address to load and the data, uh, or the, the the for store you need both the data you want to store and where to store it to, right? The store address. So um, that's it for that. Um, and then here I have a simple test program. And it's reminiscent of stuff we wrote previously in assembly. It's an infinite loop that reads a character, um, uh, an ASCII character di digit, um, and converts it from ASCII to you know numerical value by subtracting ASCII zero. Um, uh, then uh, doubles it, and then converts it back to ASCII by adding uh, ASCII zero and then doing the put jar. And then here you can see uh, the way we do infinite loops right now is um, this is, I mean, uh, interestingly, maybe this word do jump is actually implemented in fourth in quotes. Like it's not implemented in assembly. It's, you, you know, we're, we're hand assembling it here, we're hand compiling it, but it's uh, it's using do call. It's using, it's like a user style defined, defined word. So you can see the way this works here is, um, just like uh, just like do push takes its operand from the you know the instruction stream or the sequence of execution tokens, so too does jump, and um, you can see what it does is is that actually true? Do jump do from our Is that really true? I don't see where it's reading that. Oh no, sorry, I do, I do, I do. Um, when um, when it enters this uh, do jump word, uh, on top of the return stack is going to be the return address, which is this. So the return address is essentially the operand. And so when you pop from the return stack to the parameter stack, you're essentially popping the address of this thing, the address of this thing. 
So then when you load it on top of the stack, you have the address, which is this, like it's you know the value of wherever this is. Um, and then you can see I put it back on the return stack. And this is a standard thing you do in fourth where if you want to control control flow, you can push something on the return stack and then exit from the current word. Then when it exits from the current word, it's going to set the program counter to wherever the top of the return stack points. And so because here we're pushing, you know, the next, uh, you know, this thing, uh, it will basically um, go back there. Um, does this have problems with, I'm just trying to think, does this have problems with infinite recursion because we never really, um, yeah, I think it does actually. So this thing, I think in this case, the return stack would keep growing and growing because, uh, no, actually that's not true because at the top level, there is nothing on the return stack. So we don't have to worry about that here. But if we wanted, um, no, I think this is actually fine now that I think about it. Yeah, that, that is fine. So yeah. Um, Load the next thing in the instruction stream by using the return address from this, um, and then loading through it and then exiting, which will redirect to the beginning of that um, program. And so this is just a big infinite loop. So um, that's indirect threading. And um, just to demo it, if you, I mean, we have the same problem before where I'm not really, you know, it, it's interpreting like my, my new line as a, um, whatchamacallit, it's interpreting my new line as a, a number and getting doing math on that, which is not correct. So that's why I'm, you're getting the weird sigma that corresponds to doubling, uh, doing the conversion and then doubling and converting back to ASCII. But if I type one, you can see I get two and two is four and three is six and so on. Uh, five is 10, which is out of range for a single digit because I'm not doing that multi-digit stuff. Um, but anyway, so that's what the program does and that's how it works. Um, the, um, if you look at the Jones fourth, uh, thing I linked last time, they start out like I did with, um, with direct threading, uh, as I did in the last stream and then say, basically, Hey, if you uh, want to support user defined words, it's a little bit awkward. Like it's, it's actually better if you only have, um, if you only have kind of native defined words, because um, then like basically everything has a unique set of, of, of assembly instructions and you're not trying to sort of share that do call interpreter or anything like that between, between different words. Um, but they kind of imply that maybe it's not really possible or convenient uh, to support user defined words in the do call style with direct threading. So I do, I do want to kind of disprove that thesis partially, but then also make some caveats. So let me, without changing the behavior of anything, under like without changing the semantics of you know the existing code we have, let me uh, make a few changes to show you how you would support user-defined words with direct threading. And we are going to use indirect threading in our implementation, but it's such a simple change that I do want to show it. So the main thing that changes, like, like I said, is that um, rather than doing, I'm just gonna comment it out so I don't mess up when I revert it. Rather than doing this, you end up basically doing this. So the thing, uh, the execution token that you load is a direct machine code address that you can directly jump to. And so the thing that has to change uh, for these hardwired words is that um, this thing here is just like this. Um, and in this case, this macro is kind of, I mean, the way things stand, uh, this macro doesn't really do much heavy lifting. So it isn't really justifying itself, but that would basically be what it is. So def word is just defining a label a named label. And so when you call any of these do dupe type functions, you could see it would directly, um, it would directly jump into the code rather than having that level of indirection um, that we, we do here where we do another load before jumping. Um, so all of these things would work as is, but what wouldn't work would be user defined words because we were relying on this do call um, thing. However, we can just do, um, we can just do this. Like that's just to show how simple the change would be required, at least when we're doing everything manually in assembly. The only thing we would have to change is we would have to have a sort of jump, I don't know, jump pad or stub or something at the top of every user-defined word 
which jumps to do call. And so everything after that can be, uh, you know, this stuff here because X, the XT register is still going to, actually, I guess that's not strictly true. Um, if we do this, do call would have to change a little bit. Um, Like, um, we would have to do this because now it's not plus. No, actually, that's not true. This would work as well. Or would it? Let me think about that. Um, the problem potentially with this is that. Uh, Jump could be more than a single instruction if it's a far jump. Um, let, let me, yeah, I mean, maybe this makes the point that um, let's do it this way so that it's always a fixed number of bytes afterwards, whether it's a long or a short jump. Um, but yeah, so let's, let's do this instead. Um, and then, where were we? Do call would have to be like this. I'm sorry, this is the new thing. And I think that's it. I think that would work, um, but let's try. I'm not sure why I recompiled. I should just rerun. Okay, that doesn't. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. I think the yeah the parser right now can't handle this. Um, I, I yeah I have to do it like this. Yeah, it's not a label. What am I thinking about? It doesn't make any sense. Excuse me. Okay, it doesn't like this either. Um, this is, sorry, the, one of the benefits of doing this kind of program is that we actually get to test the assembler. Um, we should be able to do parse adder. I'm trying to remember, what was the other case where I recently added parse adder? I guess it's just parse expert, right? So it's um, this would be expert val, and if it's a s, it would be. I think that's how it goes. Okay. So you can see this still works. Um, and again, to, to reiterate what we did, now rather than having kind of the header word store a pointer to the code that knows how to interpret the thing, uh, we just assume that we can directly jump to the header and that's machine code. Um, and then for these native words, they don't have to do anything special. Um, but for the uh, user-defined words that, that rely on do call for interpretation, they um, you need to have this little kind of do call stub, basically. Um, that's the idea. And actually, let's... Um, I think this is what Jonesforth calls it, just to maybe keep the names a little bit consistent. We're not really going to be using his implementation, um, but this could be useful. So uh, if we wanted to have these helper macros for defining hard-coded words and sort of user-defined words that use do call, this one would be uh, 
jump do call um, and then uh, this to have a fixed offset after that um, and then all the existing uses of def word are replaced with def code and um, these then become def word do twice and we can get rid of that uh, def word do jump get rid of that and I should really stop recompiling um, so yeah this still works so yeah that's um, that's direct threading if you want to support user-defined words now let me mention um, I guess some upsides and downsides uh, one upside is that for native defined words, um, this thing is actually, I guess, a little bit less code and also a little bit more efficient because you're doing one less load. Well, you're doing one less load, basically, for that case. On the other hand, for user defined words, which, um, you know, are prevalent, uh, like are very common, like in fourth especially, you're encouraged to make very short user defined words. Um, there's a there's a little bit I guess a little bit of additional overhead um, mainly that you're instead of just doing another load you're doing another jump because you're chain jumping you're jumping to you know you're jumping to here and then this is jumping to somewhere else um, whereas with indirect threading uh, rather than doing these two chain jumps you're just doing a load and then a single jump. So that's sort of a pro and con. Another thing is if you, as we will want to do in a sec, if you want to generate these entries, not like in the assembler, uh, which knows how to assemble RISC-V instructions, but if you want to generate um, this kind of data layout, um, then jump do call is like, the, the, the assembly, the, this is not a fixed assembly sequence that you can just hard code because jump is relative. So any so if you're using any kind of relative you know position like a PC relative uh, machine code sequence for this stuff here, it will have to change for every um, for every instance depending on where it's located because do call is going to be at a fixed location but uh, each of these words we define will be at a variable location so the offset is going to differ. But um, I mean of course you can handle that it's not uh, a huge deal you just have to know how to assemble jump instructions and you can I mean you don't need a full assembler. In your fourth compiler, you can have something very specialized. You, you just basically, if you remember how we do all our stuff, um, you need to know how to encode J immediates. That's really what it is. Um, so you would need some equivalent of this to calculate. You know, you calculate the offset, you do a encode J immediate, and then you handle um, basically this this case here. You would need to hard code something like this. But I mean, that's a little bit of a wiggle, and it becomes more. It means that the the encoding here is more machine dependent. It has machine code in the way standard words are, are laid out. Whereas if all you have are kind of you know code pointers, then um, that's kind of easy to generate. You just put an absolute address there and we're good. So anyway, I just wanted to point out that you can support it. Uh, you can do you know user defined words with this kind of direct threading, but uh, we are going to be using indirect threading. So let me just revert this stuff. Uh, we w let's keep these macros though. Um, so and these macros are handy in any case. So uh, what you want is for this you want um, do call, um, and that's it. Um, and then for this case, you want to point to this label, right? So. Um, you can kind of see how the trade-offs between these two cases uh, change uh, with direct versus indirect threading. It's sort of like one of them, you have to trade off which of them gets an extra level of indirection, I, I guess, uh, at least for the machine code level stuff. So anyway, uh, this, and then I guess there's the plus eight stuff, which has to change in do call. Um, But um, otherwise, it should work. 
and it does. All right, so that's it for the, um, I guess you could say like the, 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 the minimum set of fourth runtime semantics. Um, if we were hand compiling all these user-defined words uh, with an assembler or some other helper tool, um, you could, in theory, this is really all you need, like the parameter stack, the, you know, um, the return stack and some kind of, you know, program counter, for self program counter. You, you can do everything with this, um, but obviously if this was all fourth was, it would be uh, kind of garbage. Uh, no one would really want to use it. It's more or less at this level, it's just a kind of a virtual machine that happens to have two stacks instead of one the way you might normally see it. Um, and uh, and doesn't make a hard distinction between built-in opcodes versus user-defined uh, functionality, right? Because th that is one, uh, one advantage of this approach is that Things like do uh, things like do add and do push are kind of like you know built-in opcodes, but um, you can see that they're not really encoded any differently. That's both good and bad. I mean, the bad part is that we have to encode a full pointer um, rather than say a single byte opcode, the way you might see in something like the JVM, which is a stack machine as well. Um, anyway, um, but uh, yeah, so 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 this is really the minimal core, but um, there's a bunch of other things you need to make a anything that resembles even a minimalistic fourth. And uh, the big one is the dictionary. So um, normally, of course, you do, like I said, you don't hand compile things with an assembler. You have an actual like you know the interpreter includes a fourth compiler that can generate these kinds of word definitions um, from 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 text from string data. Um, both from you know from files or in-memory strings, but also from uh, from interactive data like you're entering at the keyboard. So in order to have that, we need um, we need um, I mean at the most basic level, we need a way to map between strings like you know the string twice or dupe to um, the address of of this kind of execution token, so we can compile a reference to it when we're compiling a word. Um, and that's uh, the thing the dictionary does, what's called the dictionary in fourth. And the dictionary in fourth um, is not just, uh, it's not just like a hash table or whatever. It doesn't just store the mapping between kind of names and addresses. Uh, it also owns the data uh, that's associated with it typically. So it owns the string data, like it doesn't contain a string pointer for the thing that it associates with another address. It contains like an actual string buffer. Um, and the data it, 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 that is associated with is owned by the dictionary. It doesn't point to it. So when you make the dictionary entry, you have to kind of, before you finish the dictionary entry and publish it, you have to, um, you, you kind of have to uh, decide its size. And the way Forth has done it, it's very powerful and very simple, although obviously it has its limitations, is to um, basically have the dictionary be a big linear append-only data structure. And so uh, if, if, if you think of it as, um, I guess it's not really well described as a C struct because of variable length data, but um, a typical dictionary entry is like, um, there's a flag, and this may be like a one byte flag. Um, uh, but let's just describe it without getting into the details of how many bytes. So there's a flag that maybe has some basic information, like this is so, a so-called immediate word or not, for example. Uh, and then uh, length of name uh, or name length, name data, uh, variable number of bytes, not zero terminated. Um, and then, you know, data, like basically data payload. Um, And so um, this is the idea. Oh, sorry, actually another important uh, link to previous dictionary entry, uh, pointer uh, to previous dictionary entry, um, name length, data payload, right. Um, and so the idea, so, so if I gave you, um, if I gave you a name and I asked you to find a dictionary entry, the idea is that you have sort of a head pointer that points to the start of the chain, 
and you do a name comparison based on this data. And if it matches, then you return a pointer to that entry. Otherwise, you go up the chain, you look at this uh, entry, assuming it's not zero. So as long as the, the link is, is non-zero, you follow that chain and you try to find a name match. So pretty straightforward linear search um, kind of deal. And, um, and that's about it. Now, um, one, when you're compiling dictionary entries, um, the way it basically works is first of, I mean, fourth, fourth people call, call it compilation and it, it is a form of compilation, but it's a very straightforward kind of incremental single pass compilation. Basically what happens is you create a new dictionary entry and you can only be working on one at a time because you can think of there being, there's this big append only section of data that contains all the dictionary entries. As soon as you finish a dictionary entry, that thing is basically like you can mutate it in place, but you can't like enlarge it or anything because you've kind of committed to its size. Then you begin a new entry right after it. You start filling it in. Eventually you're done. Then you add another one. Um, and when you finish the entries, you, you reveal them, which basically means you link them into the pointer chain uh, so that they can be found when you do name lookup. Um, and so that's kind of the idea is that when you're compiling a new entry, you specify the name, it creates a new entry, you know, it fills in these header fields. Um, and then it basically leaves the cursor, um, it leaves the cursor pointing to here, which is sort of the frontier that's not filled yet. And then you can just basically put data there and bump the cursor as much as you want in order to figure out the size of the entry. Um, and so if you're compiling a word like, like one of these guys uh, here, like if um, if you're defining this in fourth, sort of like compiling it with fourth rather than hard coding it with an assembler, you know this definition would look like this. You can write it in one line if you want. Um, and uh, leaving aside exactly what the semantics of colon and semicolon are, the basic idea is this starts that this creates a new entry in the dictionary called twice, so it fills in those header fields, um, but and starts compiling it. But uh, while it's compiling it, it hasn't published the entry yet. So it's not in the chain, it's being worked on, but it hasn't been linked into that uh, dictionary entry chain. Um, and then as you see each of these words, you basically do a name lookup to, to figure out what, uh, what pointer is associated with dupe. And you figure that out, and then you just append a, a, a copy of that pointer to the current entry and bump the cursor forward by the size of a pointer. Uh, and then you do it for add as well. Uh, semicolon, one of the things it does is it implicitly uh, appends an exit so that, you know, at the end of a word, you always exit. But it does other stuff as well, like it changes the mode uh, from interpreting to compiling, basically. Because normally out here, if you would type dupe sort of outside of this con kind of context, dupe means execute dupe immediately. But inside here, you're in a compilation mode where when you see dupe, it means append a reference to dupe to the current word that sort of deal. But anyway, that's the that's the purpose uh, and, uh, of the dictionary and how it's used. So um, let's let's code that up. That's the next data structure we need in order to move towards uh, something like a, a real fourth system. Um, and so um, let's see here. So right now, basically, I guess we have um, I guess we yeah we have a code pointer as well, um, which is our do call with our indirect threading, um, or a custom thing. Um, so yeah, that's part of it too. So basically, one thing we will have to do for these is these will have some stuff beyond beyond just the um, beyond just the code pointer. Right, like we'll need these other things. Let's not worry about the flag, but um, let's do the pointer to the previous entry, the name length, and the name data. Um, and I guess right now, yeah, let me, right now I have some helpers. I guess I didn't actually. So one thing I want is I want a way to um, to append string data.
Um, And um, this version here does not um, does not append a zero terminator because that's kind of a C convention and you don't want to hard code that as your default um, for this. But you can have it like a stir Z, like a zero terminated version of this. But anyway, um, so stir, blah, 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 asm token stir. And then we want to um, asm bytes. I think that's what, that's what we called it. So data size, roger, roger. Um, so this should be very simple. You should just say data size. So that's stir and stir len. Um, and that's it. So we're not emitting a zero terminator. We're just emitting this as is. You know, while we're here, you could uh, do something like this um, and then zero terminate as well. So this is stir z, z stands for zero. If you want to do, it's like the same thing, but with zero termination, uh, we won't be using that, but uh, let's add it while we're here. Um, all right, um, so if we want to define a word, um, let me think here. Let me figure out how to share code between these two cases in a sec, but let's do this case first. So the very first entry is going to be the the, the length of the name, um, and we're going to make that if, if we're going to make that four bytes. I just want to keep everything four byte aligned. That's very wasteful, and we should pack it later. But um, let's not worry about that very uh, right the second. Um, so the first thing is going to be the length of the name, and um, the way I'm going to calculate that is using label math. Um, so I'm going to say it's a f well. Let's just do dot 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 for a sec. Um, here we have the name, um, so we're just going to create these two anonymous labels so we can calculate the length. And you could have helper functions like constant helpers that can do this, but uh, it's very easy to do this kind of thing with uh, this kind of pointer arithmetic. Um, so you can do uh, 2 minus 1, so that's just subtracting the beginning and end, so this will be the number of characters, since so uh, 1 byte per character. And uh, then following this, we have, um, what was it? Uh, name length, right, and then comes that stuff. Um, I guess I can just do it like this. Uh, name minus one. Um, I mean, oh, and I guess that's not. So I guess one thing we haven't done quite here is we haven't made a distinction between the name and the label. Um, um, let's take this as an opportunity to add, an, uh, to add a macro or an assembler feature because you, and I know Jones Forth uses the gas version of this as well, um, but basically, if I type something like, no, I mean, I I think I actually do want the ability to have separate because the identifier, yeah, I don't care. There's not that much redundancy. So so let's just say this is the label and this is the name. Um, and this is the label, and this is the name. So this is 
this is the label. Um, There's no reason it has to be two, but let's just keep the numbers unique in this local context. Um, so let's see, length of name, name data, um, label with the code pointer. All right. So, so far it should still work um, because the labels we define, oh, actually it won't work. Um, it won't work because um, there's two things. There's the label and you know what? Let's rename all this do underscore crap with just like underscore. Uh, we were doing it to prevent the replace next control shift h okay let's do that um, and then for each of these we also have to specify the string and this is where I, and i think jonesforth does this you could be more clever with uh, using the macro, um, using the macro system for some of these names to convert the an identifier to a name. But I actually don't want to do that. I think because um, fourth identifiers are much more flexible for one. Um, we won't be doing too many of these things anyway. So. Um, Like this, for example, is conventionally and forth called like that. This is called like that. And this is like this, and this is like that. Something like this. All right, that's interesting. So what aligns is unexpected token null. Um, thirty four. Is this thirty four? Um, well, clearly some of these, actually, let me just trigger that again, because I clearly overlooked one of the uh, kind three, zero, one, two, three.
All right. So um, this is probably just a parser bug. Um, Okay, so it's definitely it's definitely parsing multiple parameters here. Um, so I guess it's next token. Um, This is the next macro. Yeah, def code is the thing we want. So this would be oh, interesting. Okay, so this is line 34. Okay, that is the problem one. So let's see what's going on here. Um, Parse the first, so, I mean, first of how many have we? We should have two parameters, right? Um, so we've already parsed one. Now we pass the macro arg. So I guess the current token at this point should be a string. Which is, yeah, that's what it is, and it's dupe. Um, Oh, I see what it is. At least one of the issues. So that is correct, actually. That was never really a bug. Well, it was a bug in my assembly code, but not in the assembler. Um, right, okay. So this should still work. Of course, it doesn't still work. <laughs> um. Changed. Def code label name. The label points to the code pointer. And then two here. Okay, let's see stop it. Okay, so the very first Um, so load from that, add four to another plug over direction there, and then jump to that. 
Um, Death code underscore get shot will be wrong. Okay, let's execute that again. I just remind myself of the register allocation. So X1 is SP, X3 is PC. XT is the execution token. So that's the stack pointer. That's the Oh, well, this is uh, certainly a bug. So let me just fix that. Um, I don't think that was the bug, but um, let's do it like this. All right, so that loads the LSP and this is the one after that. Four, so let's see. Um, Right, so that loads that. So supposedly, I mean, so that's uh, X4. That looks like a reasonable offset because it's once, I mean, and actually, I mean, I, I can, I, I forgot about this, but you can totally do uh, use some of our debugging features. Um, Um, so the first, I think the first one was get char, right? Just to verify. So get char, get char is 169. Why is it an odd address? Couldn't be an alignment thing, right? I mean, that's definitely an issue I hadn't thought about. Um, all 
But anyway, 165 plus 4 is 9, so at least those... But anyway, when we then do the load, load from that address should be 169. And then we jump to that. And it's an illegal instruction. Okay, that's interesting, to say the least. Oh, look at this rounding. It's because it's not two-byte aligned, right? JLR rounds to two-byte boundaries. So that's the issue. So it was an alignment issue. Okay. Um, so the question is, how can... Mm, that's an annoying thing with string data. String data d tends to be... I mean, obviously, we can align the whole thing by, um, you can always just do this, right? You can always do align four. Um, and that's an, I think that's enough for us for now. But um, it means that doing the math for, the code, for finding the code pointer is less easy, which probably suggests that this thing here should be maybe at the top even. Because that way the code can be aligned and we can just pad it out like this. Um, it also means all the variable length data is back to back, which sounds like a good idea anyway. That was just a stupid alignment issue. Okay, that was not just a stupid alignment issue. Something else apparently is going on. But anyway, let's try re-executing that. Um, okay, these are not aligned either. Oh, sorry. The this thing is not pointing to the right place. It should point after. Um, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, code is still up. Uh, And the is aligned. We can actually jump to it. Um, 
Okay, 51, that's the right ASCII character. Okay, so stuff is happening. So it's just some minor details then. Maybe for user to find words. Okay, so the very first word is the. Oh, the problem with this is now you. Okay, I see what the problem is now. Yeah, the problem with this is now you can't locate. Um, it has its own set of problems. I mean, it's possible to do this alignment calculation at runtime when doing dictionary lookups. That's not too bad. So let's just do it like that. Um, what else? Okay, so that works. Anyway, that took longer than it should have, but that is assembly for you sometimes. Um, so anyway, now we're back to basically where we were, but we're actually defining the data structure. Um, let us define a, um, how are we doing on time? I'm probably gonna do an extra long stream today because I've kind of been chomping at the bit to do some of this stuff over the weekend. I tried to uh, force myself not to actually start writing code. So I wanna make some progress, but anyway. Um, yeah, all right. So now we've filled in the entries. One thing, oh yeah, we, we don't have the link field yet. Um, we can use constants for that. Um, so we'll do it like this. Latest starts out as zero. I'm going to make that the very first entry here. Um, and I guess since this whole thing is not aligned, there's no reason really to make this. Let's just make these bytes. Since it's adjacent to string data, it's going to be unlined as a group anyway. Um, right, so latest is like here. Um, the stuff into a header um, They don't flash because they're position. Um, okay. All right, so yeah, this is that stuff. Uh, let's just make sure that still works. Okay. Um, and then we want to do the linking here. I guess we're going to do it like this. Um, it's going to link to latest, and then latest is going to point to this. So 
So what this means is we, you know, we encode a pointer to the current latest pointer. Uh, and this is a this is the constant, by the way. Once we've initialized this in the assembler, we will initialize the runtime version of latest based on this uh, value after all the init time stuff has been done. So, yeah, I think that's it. Just gonna test that still works. Yep. Um, And now you want to write a function routine, which um, I guess I'll just call it find. And uh, you give it You give it arguments in T1 and T2. Um, and uh, I guess yeah, we, we need more temp registers, which is fine. We, we're not going to need really a whole lot of registers for the fourth words, but every once in a while we might want to have a few more. So let's just add them as needed. Um, Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, we need a yeah. We need a runtime version of latest. Um, I can't remember. Maybe I'll just do this, just to emphasize what it is. Then latest will be like this thing will be, maybe I'll just call it uh, Just put random stuff, random variables here. And so this is going to be, we're going to reserve space for a you know global variable basically based on the initial value of this is going to be based on the assembly time final value. Let's just call it latest box, something like that. Think of a better name later. And I need a whole thing resized. Um, all right. Okay, so what was fine doing? Right, so um, we're going to load latest and um, let's see. Oh, sorry, T3. Then, um, oh no, let's see. No, if latest is, sorry, so if, if this is zero, so this is going to be a running pointer. Um, If this is, if T3 is zero, then we're done. Um, Uh, 
forward branch. All right. So if this is zero otherwise, you want to load from whatever, what's the offset? Um, Name lane offset is four, name offset is five, um, link offset is zero. That's right. Four. Um, so T4 um, so this is the length T4 is not equal to T2, then we want to skip. This, this, this will end up being 3. Um, actually, let me just call it done for now. So I can keep track of it. Um, so if the names don't match, then go to label 2. And here we are going to replace this with the next thing in the chain and then jump back to the top. Uh, otherwise, we are going to, I mean, do a comparison. Let me just write some comments here. Um, let's use more temp registers. Wait, let me think. Um, so, right. So we need a temp, T5 is T1, T6 is T6 should be um, T3 plus name offset. Um, so these are
Let's see. So if the names match, um, while if so, let's see. If this is zero, then. I'm so out of practice writing simple assembly stuff, it'll come back to me once we start getting more into it. So if, I mean, basically what I'm trying to write is like, um, something like that. So if this is zero, then go to um, no, actually, if it's zero, if it's not zero, then do it. Otherwise, Found a match. I'm just going to put in a ret. Um, so if we get all the way down to zero, we're good. Um, let's see here. Actually, let me write it out sort of in pseudo C code before I confuse myself more. Um, let me just write out the whole thing. Um, and I'm just going to use the registers as pseudo variables. So, um, Um,
Okay. I think that's what this works out to. All right, all right, all right. See her. All right. I don't necessarily, I mean, I'm not as fluent in assembly as I was when I was doing this many, many years ago, but um, let's try basically, and I guess this is also a good exercise if you haven't tried writing non trivial things in assembly. I mean, not to say this loop is super non trivial, but there's multiple nested loops and a bunch of variables in play, so. Um, let's actually just try using this sort of pseudo C code as a template for how to write down the corresponding assembly. Um, and uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the while loops and turn them into conditional jumps to mimic how assembly code is. Um, and so um, Well, okay, let's use the, the dump style, which has an extra unconditional branch. Um, so you basically want to say if, uh, oh, OBS disconnected. Let's wait for it to reconnect. All right, I'm back, I think. Uh, yeah, my residential crappy internet connection just dropped for a sec. Um, but anyway, yeah, let's try turning this into assembly. And to start, I'm going to change this while loop to a bunch of you know labels and conditional go-tos and stuff like that. So let's just write it in the dumbest, most straightforward way possible, where um, you say, if, if this is 0, go to done um, and so I'm going to write it like this and same thing here if uh, there's going to be loop 2 if this is 0 then go to done 2 
actually let me just look at the original code because I just realized there's one thing missing so I want to get that correct first because we never advance we never advance this stuff um, t3 t3 plus link offset This is about right. <clears throat> Let's see. If it's zero, then we're done. Otherwise, load the name. Or sorry, note the na name length. If the names don't match, go to the next entry. If the names match, load start pointers for these two strings. And then um, count use T4 as a countdown loop variable. If we ever count down to zero, it means all, everything up to that point matched, so we return true. Otherwise, load the next characters from those respective strings. If they don't match, then the strings didn't match, and we will try the next dictionary entry. Otherwise, we advance these string pointers and decrement the loop counter and repeat the loop. Um, So either we get to the end of this or we get to next, and we can get to next either from the string length mismatching or a character mismatch. And in that case, we load the next link and repeat the loop. And if we ever get to done one, it means um, nothing matched. We reach the beginning of the chain without finding a match. All right. So. Um, this is kind of one way you can take something like very low level pseudo C and lower it into something that's eventually uh, assembly code. And so, I mean, I can even translate it if you want uh, line by line, which I don't think is necessarily a good policy, but whatever, let's just do it. Um, so T1 is latest. Latest is a global variable rather than a register, so we have to uh, load that. Um, then we have a loop, and what we want to say is if this is zero, go to done one, or just done one. Um, but otherwise, we're going to load um, from that off. Let's see what looks like there. As we go. Um, if these match, then go to next. 
Um, it's just a register to register move. Say three op brand. Uh, add. Um, one. This is a load. So we have to do and this two is load. And this is uh Should have been go to on the code, but um, what was done to done to is return true. Um, let's see. Let's use the fourth stack for that. Um, by saying this on this one here um, and then next Actually, this should be minus one because in the fourth, people usually uh, use all ones as a bit mask to indicate a one. But uh, for branches, all you care about is non-zeroness anyway. So this should be zero. Oh. Um, so have to increment that as well. Something like that. Boy, oh boy. I use so many different programs that have different multi. Oh, here we go. Dives.
Um, so T1, T2. T1 is string pointer, so I guess it should be second from top. Since we leave one result on the stack, I guess it, the, the net adjustment is only four, and then we can get rid of these. Okay, chances of this working are approximately zero. All right, yeah, we, we have to do these label fixes. Um, so loop one, let's just call that one. This thing is also wrong, this should have been loop one. Oh, right, right. Can't store. Well,
get assembled. Let's try um, well, what's a good example? Let me put in a new program rather than just crap. Um, push, have the push in some kind of test string. Um, and then find. Let's see here. So what's the latest? Let's try to find an actual match. Um, Or temp. Um, yeah. Let's see if it does anything. Reference but never defined. No way. All right, all right. Okay, so that's Okay, so that's clearly it's not computing the length. Oh, sorry, this should be a constant, not a uh, course. Sorry. My bad.
Okay, so we're actually in it now. Okay, that's totally garbage. X10, it's T3. B and E. We're doing one time, almost two hours. This is what. Oh, right here. So T3 is supposed to be the, the pointer. And it's comparing. I mean, I'm clearly comparing the wrong variables. <laughs> because T4 should be the name. 52 is still way too long, so that can't be an actual name. So that's a bug. Um, but I'm definitely comparing to the wrong shit in any case. Okay, I'm just going to do some superficial debugging and then stop with stream because we're getting into some deeper waters where I might want to add a few more debugger features to make this non awkward. Um, okay, so X, so this should be one. So x8 is the string pointer, uh, x9 is the string length, and then I have to load latest into x10, and then This is not zero. So we then load x11, which should be. Actually, I know why. Um, I know there's one reason this was wrong. LBU should be a byte. That's why when we load x11, it's going to be some massive number. Yeah, okay, that's, so that's the reason we were seeing that before. Okay. A, a string of length three. And let's see if I can actually see what it is. It would be the latest here. It would have to be this. That's length four. X11 and X4. Mm. 
no, no, sorry, X9, X11. Um, let me just check something here. Oh, this has the alignment. That's totally wrong. Cannot be how you do it. The alignment has to be after. Okay, okay, okay. So the way we're going to do it is like this. So that's the address and that's the length. So that's length one. And then we load latest. That is non zero. So we load the length. And the length is one. Then you say as long as so if these do not match, then skip, but they do in fact match. And so um, we initialize those pointers. And as long as that loop counter is non zero. We load from the first pointer, the second pointer. Those should also not be load words, so that's another bug. Like these should be just do LDU. Doesn't really matter if we compare them as sign extended or zero extended, but uh, LDU is a little bit closer to how I usually think about it. Um, Also, just make sure I didn't screw this up. So X11 and X9 match. Um, so here we load the string pointers. As long as the counter is non zero, then we load these bytes. So what was that? X14 and X15. And those do match. And because they do match, Wait. So they did match. Uh, 
Oh no, sorry. All of them have to match, so that's correct. So the first the first character match, but in this case there's only one character. And now x11 is zero. And so when we go back here, this thing is going to finish. Um This is going to chain back. All right. So this found the match, I guess. So um, let me, um, without single stepping, let's um, just kind of using this crappy. Actually, let's just do some user-defined words for this stuff. Um, So um, let's say put did it because there should be a zero or one on top of the stack. And actually, let's just make this a little bit harsh. So I don't worry about put did it being weird. Um, and then let's read something just to provide a pause point. And then let's jump back to the top. Okay, so it always prints four. It's very interesting. So here there are two things on the stack, and it should leave one thing on the stack. Put digit. I have a drop board. It's weird that it always returns four. Oh no, that's right. And the way I've adjusted the stack means that this is the topmost entry. Okay, so it's returning one. That's correct. So now if um, if I make it something else, it should exercise another path. But still returns one, which is correct. If I make it something like zero, um, it returns zero. I mean, this could be anything. Um, what about longer strings like drop? Okay, so it, it actually seems to work. Um, Of course, what we really want find to do is to actually push two things. Um, the topmost is going to be a zero or one flag, but we actually want a little bit more than that, which means we also don't need this. So this is going to be the topmost. Um, but this is going to be I'm just going to use kind of pseudo notation. 
Um, I mean, let's just do it like let's let's leave it like that. Um, so the current it's T three, right? T one, T three. So if you do this, then it should still have the flag on top of the stack, but it should also have the pointer to the thing. And actually in this case where nothing is found, um, I think you want to have zero on the stack, so a zero pointer for both. A zero pointer. Both. All right. So the good news is I think this routine works, at least for the cases I quickly tested here. And uh, it took way too long to write, but um, that's why most people <laughs> don't write workmanlike code in assembly for fun, because um, yeah, I mean, was, I guess it wasn't too bad in the end, but uh, I'm certainly also super out of practice. But anyway, I guess it ended up serving as a decent case study of how to take some fairly high-level C code and kind of lower it progressively into assembly code, um, which is not necessarily how you should always write assembly code, but it's certainly a good kind of Rosetta Stone approach to get started. Um, so we didn't get to the point where we can actually do a command interpreter and a compiler using this approach, but I think you can now see that um, we're, we're getting there. Now we would be able to use, it, like if we can fill in the temp string buffer and call this find thing, and then if there's a match, append the match to you know the current dictionary entry we're building, you can see how you would have a simple compiler. Unfortunately, this was all I was able to do in the time allotted, but um, hopefully it wasn't too boring. So uh, I'll, I'll continue working on this for the rest of the week. Um, and I will probably work on this off stream rather than trying to buffer up all my ideas for the stream since some of this will be pretty tedious. Um, but I think this was kind of instructive since this is the first non-trivial control flow we've written in assembly code. So anyway, um, let me let me just quickly answer. There's Someone was asking what's ION in the Bitwise repo. And yeah, it's the systems programming language that we, um, that we developed for the project. So we're already pretty deep in terms of the language stack. ION is implemented in C but we'll soon be self-hosting. Then in ION, we implemented a simulator and an assembler for RISC-V, and now we are implementing fourth on top of that assembler. So we already have like a pretty deep stack of our own languages work st standing on top of each other. Uh, for the mo So basically everything is stuff we wrote ourselves, and, and ION is kind of the C equivalent in our stack. So anyway, that was it for today. Uh, I will be back uh, next time. So see everyone.